so if you take my premise that Islam plays this outsized role in public life, then the challenge, if we want to fast forward to the modern era, is how do we accommodate Islam's role in public life? If, if, you, if you agree with me that Islam can't be privatized in the same way that Christianity was in, say, much of Western Europe, then what do we do about Islam, right? And I think that 1924 is such an important date for me when I try to understand developments in the Middle East and actually more broadly is because, you know, for the better part of 14 centuries from the seventh century until 1924, in some sense, there has always been at least one caliphate. Sometimes there were competing caliphates. Um, but then 1924 represents this formal breach where subsequently there is no longer a kind of representative of the so-called Islamic Ummah or, or the Islamic nation or the Islamic community. And ever since 1924, I would argue, there has been this ongoing struggle to establish a legitimate political order in much of the Middle East. There's been a vacuum ever since then. And what Muslims have been fighting over to a large degree are these very foundational and existential questions over the appropriate role of religion in public life and the relationship between Islam and the state. And then also you can think of it, the state and Islam. Um, and, uh, and that is an ongoing, uh, ongoing set of questions that remains to this day unresolved. So even if we fast forward even further to the Arab Spring, why did the Arab Spring start off with such optimism and then devolve into chaos, conflict, and polarization? One main reason is that Egyptians, um, Yemenis, Libyans, you name it, they couldn't come to an agreement over the appropriate role for Islam and Islamic law. And there were people who were so afraid of the public role of religion that even when Islamist par parties did well in elections and came to power, and the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt is the main example of that, that they supported ending the democratic process because they wanted to maintain some kind of secular state identity. And I think that you can't understand the 2013 coup in Egypt without understanding how Islamists on one hand and secularists or liberals on the other hand came to see each other as, as in some sense, enemies. And, um, and a large part of that had to do with, well, they said that they're, you know, they're all Egyptians technically, but being Egyptian wasn't enough because they didn't, they didn't agree on what it meant to be Egyptian. And part of that had to do with religion. Can we actually dive even deeper into these, um, into these, you know, highlights, uh, historical highlights? Um, can I even ask, like, what specifically is uh, a caliphate, and 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 how exactly did that did the caliphates fall in in 1924 during this time? Yeah, sure. So maybe. So maybe along with caliphate, I should also probably define Islamist. Um, so uh, the way that I define this, and you know, I think most academics do as well, is Islamists are those who believe that Islam and Islamic law should play a central role in public life. That's the first part of the definition. The second part is, and then they organize politically around that goal. Because there are many ordinary Muslims who believe in some application of Islamic law, that doesn't automatically make them Islamists unless that is their conscious political identity. So, um, so that's one. Now, caliphate, um, the first caliphate, we go back to after the death of Prophet Muhammad. And the caliphates are basically the successors to, to, the, um, to the prophetic state. So this actually goes back to part of the exceptionalism argument that Prophet Muhammad unlike, say, Jesus Christ, was not just um, a, man, a man of religion. Uh, Prophet Muhammad wasn't just a theologian or a cleric. He was also a political figure. He was also a statesman. He was also a head of a proto-state in Medina, which, was in, um, which is in modern, what is now modern-day Saudi Arabia. And 
Um, he was also a state builder. So this has major implications for how Islam evolves from its very founding moment, because if the early Muslims are contending with questions of how to govern, because they got to deal with a state, right? Then the Quran naturally has to say something and include verses and chapters that deal with politics and public law and governance. On the other hand, if you take the New Testament, the New Testament has very little to say about public law and governance. Why? Because Jesus wasn't dealing with questions of governance. Jesus was a dissident against a reigning state. And after, after Jesus, um, Jesus died, and then Christianity developed in its formative, in its formative years, the early Christians didn't really have a chance to govern either. They were living as minorities under largely Roman law. And it was only se several centuries later that Christians actually could govern themselves, right? So because of that, the New Testament is not going to be focused on governance. So that, that's very key. And when we talk about governance, this leads back to your question about the caliphate is that these caliphates had a kind of religious and moral and legal authority that was very closely tied to Islam and Islamic law. And Islamic law, or what is called Sharia, even though Sharia as an Arabic word goes a little bit beyond the narrow Western conception of law, but it's still a rough translation, that these were states where Sharia imbued every aspect of public life. And... Um, and you had local courts that made judgments according to Islamic law. Um, you know, one, another example that um, that is one of the obvious ones is that public alcohol consumption was restricted, even though people did drink privately. And there was an interesting division in the early caliphates between the private and public realm, that um, the public realm was seen as having as as a. Uh, um, as having a kind of religious importance, because if you do something publicly, that affects other people in your society. On the other hand, people should be able to do what they want in the privacy of their own homes. Um, so, um, but anyway, these various caliphates um, were, um, they were not secular, obviously. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, Islam played an important role in various ways, and that continued more or less until I would say the 19th century, then we start to see reforms under the, um, the latter day Ottoman Caliphate, where under pressure from the Western world and with the new, new ideas of secularization and classical liberalism being introduced, there were Turkish officials and Turkish and young and, and Turkish leaders who tried to, in some sense, secularize, not completely, but introduce some secular elements into the Ottoman Caliphate. Then we can fast forward a little bit. The Ottoman Caliphate could have continued, but then World War I uh, changes things. Then after the conclusion of World War I, we see a kind of Turkish nationalism building up, and there's a new Turkish nationalist leader who, who was playing an important role at the time named Ataturk, and then Ataturk was quite secular in his approach and very, in some sense, aggressively secular, where he wanted to essentially depoliticize de Islam and really replicate the French model of aggressive secularism. And that leads ultimately to the formal abolition of the caliphate in 1924. Um, I've heard you give uh, a couple talks with, when you talk about the time, you know, 1924, you mentioned on how you just mentioned how significant it is, and you've even uh, pointed out that I guess some people in the audience, you're like, yeah, some people are nodding their head because they understand how <laughs> significant that time. Was there like a particular event or something that happened that has that m made people so respond to it so specifically? Well, that, that's just a kind of joke that I do sometimes when I give public talks because it's it's sort of it would it's impressive if people know what 1924 symbolizes so it's almost a way to kind of test the crowd it's also a way to kind of joke about whether a crowd is very old because well you know if you have like a very old crowd with a bunch of people like with white hair it is theoretically possible that they were still alive in 19 or that they were alive in 1924 it's getting harder now because i guess you'd have to be like 96 or something 
there's just a kind of joke that I do. But if you're, you know, but most people actually, most American audiences are not are not usually familiar with what happened in 1924. That said, in the Middle East, um, you know, if you talk to to people in the region, they'll ha they might have a sense of what happened in 1924. But still, it seems like a really long time ago, right? So, yeah. So what was the what was the outcome of that? Because I imagine if the efforts for secularization were effective enough that there actually was a fall of the caliphate, that that there was some um, that th it was effective in a way. I mean, were people drawn to that? Um, were they looking for a change or was it more of a, a forceful situation? I guess what was the result yeah. of that? So certainly some of it was a forced secularization. So in the case of Turkey under Ataturk, there was elite buy-in into this idea of let's become more like the West. But these elite sensibilities didn't necessarily spread to the rest of the country. And this is still at a time when levels of higher education are quite low. Literacy was still relatively low. And that was one of the major initiatives in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s was to rapidly improve literacy. But you did have this very stark divide between elites in, in, in Istanbul versus people who were living in the countryside of Anatolia. So, that, um, so I think when we talk about secularization being successful in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, we, it was, but only up to a point because there was always a limit to the popular buy-in. We also see this in Egypt, especially under the Nasser regime in the 50s and 60s, where Nasser was a secular, sort of somewhat socialist leader who was extremely popular. And my parents grew up in, in part under the Nasser regime um, before they, um, and then the Sadat regime, after, and then they immigrated. But um, Nasser, um, if you, people, people like Nasser because he was a nationalist leader who made Egyptians proud of being Egyptian. So that part is certainly true. But I think, again, there was a limit to the idea of Western secularization if you go into the more rural parts of Egypt at that time. So, and then there was also repression. We don't know, there were, there were probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people who were uncomfortable with aspects of secularization, but they couldn't really express that publicly because these were authoritarian regimes that did not allow for any kind of significant dissent. And that's why we have to be careful of assuming that a forced secularization can be true secularization because anything that is forced is not really an organic part of society. And that's why we see, I think, later, after you remove the forced secularization, people try to return to their religious identity. And we see a religious revival really spreading throughout the Middle East, starting in the 1970s and then gaining strength in the 80s and 90s. And that happens even in the most secularized of the Middle Eastern countries, which is Turkey. And also Tunisia was another country that experienced decades of forced secularization, but once you have the removal of the secular dictator, what do Tunisians do in 2011? They vote for an Islamist party. So is this why sometimes you'll see past images of uh, people in the Middle East? I, I don't know. I don't know where exactly, but, you know, wearing bikinis on the beach or something in, in like the 50s, 60s, and then you probably wouldn't see that so much today. And like, you know, Iran and, and countries like that. Yeah, certainly. Um, I think this is, it's a common trope, if you will, um, to kind of say, well, oh, look in the 50s and 60s, we have these black and white pictures where people seem free and liberated and women are wearing what up, you know, bikinis and swimsuits and all of that. Um, it's all true. And I think that, you know, we should take note of changes that happened over time. But I think sometimes it's sort of, it's sort of presented in, again, this kind of patronizing way of why can't Arabs go back to the way they were in the fifties and sixties, almost treating that period as an ideal point. Right. But again, was it ideal if people were suffering under re repression. You gotta look at the broader picture. This was not some kind of golden 
liberal age. This was an age of, of fear, um, of repression, of authoritarianism, and also of failure. And 1967 represents a kind of turning point in a way where you have Arab armies being defeated by Israel in the famous Six Day War. And this marks a kind of a failure of a system that was tr that people were attempting to build in the 50s and 60s. So it doesn't lead to great outcomes, right? Um, and again, I think that there's an elite, there's an elite bias here that a lot of the pictures that you see are more secular elites, well-educated people in the capital cities. And we're not talking about the broader population. I mean, if you go to the countryside of Egypt, you're not going to see people wearing bikinis. That's something that you're going to see in the port town of Alexandria or in Cairo, um, in the major urban centers. Um, it is interesting though, and I, you know, I've talked to my parents about this. So my mom, um, she was born, I think in 1957. Yeah. And then, um, you know, she tells me that when she was growing up, it was very rare to see a woman covering her hair. That was just like a weird thing. Then she starts to notice it more when she enters college in the 1970s. She starts to see that some of her classmates are putting on the headscarf. And it's no mistake that it's happening at that time, because as I mentioned, the 1970s see this kind of religious revival where people are trying to reconnect with their faith and bring their faith more, more into the public arena. And wearing the headscarf was one way of expressing that. So there are these really important changes that my parents, you know, witnessed in real time that I think that if you're, if you're um, under 40 or under 30 and you're living in the Middle East, you don't really remember a time when the headscarf was rare because now in at least most Arab countries, the headscarf is quite common if not, if not the significant majority of women wear the headscarf. Um, so that is definitely real. And if we want to use those those black and white pictures to capture what was um, really in some ways a striking shift, then that I think is useful. That said, if we want to look at the broader sweep of history, that moment of secularism or secular influence in the, in the 40s, 50s and 60s, I tend to see that as an aberration, that that was the exception that proves the rule. And if we look at the broader sweep, we're just talking about a few decades over the centuries, you know? So I think that if we put it in perspective, you know, can we really say that that was, that that was the natural future that the Middle East was going through? Clearly it wasn't the natural future because it didn't end up, it didn't end up sustaining itself over time. And there was a reversal back to like a, a back to a more, religiously oriented identity. When you when you talk about uh, repression going on during that time, are you able to provide some examples of how it was that maybe did make people want to go back to a more religious, you know, traditional culture? Yeah, well, so when it comes to repression, we have the case um, under the Nasser regime, the main victims of repression were the Muslim Brotherhood at, at the time. And the Muslim Brotherhood was driven underground, and many of its leaders were either in prison or in exile. Some were executed um, in the 50s and 60s under Nasser. And um, and so you know, sometimes you might hear people say, "Well, if, when they're trying to explain why extremism came about in the modern Middle East, that you have to look back to the dungeons and prisons of Gamal Abdel Nasser, because in prisons, that's where many, many people were radicalized because um, people, people had to survive in very difficult conditions. And there were also incidents of torture that, um, that happened in these prisons. And, you know, there is, there is some academic literature about how torture and very high levels of re repression can really push people to go over the edge and to consider violence or extremist methods. So that's part of, I think, the broader story. Um, so that's, that's certainly part of it. But when we talk about why people wanted to return to religion, I mean, one way of looking at it is if we look at the late 1940s, 
the Muslim Brotherhood was the largest movement in Egypt. So there were estimates range from 500,000 to a million Egyptians were members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And at that time, Egypt was about 20 million. So that's like a massive proportion of the overall population. And for an organization that had that many people to be driven underground in the 1950s, that's, that's a very incredible shift in a very short period of time. Then if we fast forward to 1967 and the failure of the Six Day War, people start to question and say, well, Nasser promised that we would become this great united Arab nation and Arab nationalism and all these ambitious ideas of fighting Israel and becoming strong and becoming proud to be Arab, but then to have such a humiliating defeat after all the hype of the Nasser era, that was such, um, people couldn't get their head around it. And that's what provoked a lot of soul searching and it took time to really take hold. But we see this soul searching um, from really 1967 into the 70s, into the 80s, that people are still struggling to understand what went wrong. And there's actually um, there's a famous book by Bernard Lewis, which captures some of this called What Went Wrong? Question um, mark. But that is a question that I think I even grew up with in Pennsylvania, in the Arab community that I was a part of there that you would have these dinner table conversations. And I talk a little bit about this in my book that where, you know, if, if dinner goes long enough, at some point you're going to have a conversation about, Oh, we used to be this great civilization. We have this great history that we're proud of as Arabs and Muslims. But then we try to make sense of how we went from those moments of greatness of scientific, philosophical, technological advancement to what we are today. And that's kind of devastating. It's hard to kind of, it, it, it was a precipitous drop. It was a precipitous drop because if you look at the Middle East right now, um, you know, we kind of suck. I mean, to kind of put it in, in, in stark terms, and that's very hard to deal with. If you have a memory, a historical memory or a historical knowledge of these great empires and these great caliphates that we all learn about when we're growing up and when we're um, reading books in Sunday school. So I think that a lot of Arabs and Muslims more, uh, Arabs and Muslims um, have to contend with this complicated history of rise and fall. And I know I'm getting kind of nitpicky here with the history and we won't spend a long time on this, but since you say it's such a, a momentous, um, you know, historical event, the Six Day War, uh, do you mind just doing a quick recap of that for maybe people who, who aren't sure what happened there? I mean, if you're saying that it completely, you know, switched the, the you know, mentality um, from, from to one of kind of di like despair, it kind of sounds like. Well, so it's very rare to have wars that only last six days. So even the name of the war is kind of a, a humiliation. Um, and keep in mind that there were several Arab armies that were involved. And um, I'm trying to think what the population in Egypt would have been at the time. Maybe, maybe somewhere around 40 million. And Israel might have been around, I don't know, like 4 million or something like that, give or take. So for um, a relatively small state, and Israel at that time was barely 20 years old. So we're talking about a young state that doesn't have a large population being able to defeat not only the Egyptian army, but several other um, armies. And, um, you know, just how is that, you know, how is that even possible? So you have... Um, uh, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and they get destroyed by the Israeli army. So it's hard, it's hard for me to even think of a comparable war that represents such utter defeat from, and, and the, the much larger group that represents the much larger population is the one that suffers that defeat. I'm sure there are other examples, but the fact that they're not really ones that we can think of very quickly shows us how rare this kind of failure, this kind of military failure is. So then if you, if you suffer, if you go through that military 
failure, then you start to ask yourself, wait, was there something deeper in our society that was, that, that was decayed, that was falling apart? Because what could explain a military failure except some deeper societal failure? Something went wrong. And um, I think that's the best way to look at what happened is, you know, when we face failure, when we face defeat, and this applies to nations, but it also applies to individuals. So we can relate to this on an individual level. If we go through something really bad in our own lives, at some point, we got to sit down and try to make sense of why and how it happened. So do you think that this is what you're referencing, This what sounds like a moral struggle since then. Is that what you reference in the subtitle of your book? Which is, and you can, I'll let you. Yeah, 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 sure. So the subtitle is How the Struggle Over Islam is Reshaping the World. So, I mean, 1967 is an important part of the story. Um, and But there are a number of other dates. And I think that it can sometimes... You know, we don't we don't necessarily want to get too focused on one date because this is a very long history. And in my in my book, I try to cover about, you know, 14 centuries of history. So I got to you know, that's a lot to cover. But 67, 1924, um, obviously, the founding moment of Islam is very critical to, to this very day because you can't understand a religion without understanding its founding moment. Um but it's uh, yeah. Sorry. Oh, oh no! I was just going to say it sounds like like what we just talked about: the fall of the caliphate, the Six Day War, um, this you know what yeah what seemed like uh, you know what sounds like a, a forceful um, secularization um, that this has kind of resulted in the struggle today. I think I think the culmination of everything we just talked about is that, yeah. I, I think is that what you're you're referencing? Exactly. It all leads to this ongoing struggle over the role of Islam. And people still can't agree on that. And that's in part what people are fighting over. So, you know, basically there's two ways of dealing with this. One is to say that, you know, then Muslims have to get over this and find a way to secularize and that's the only ultimate solution. The other approach is to say that if Islam plays this outsized role in public life, then we have to come to terms with that role and we have to, in some sense, accommodate or find a place for Islam in public life. Now, this is a cha- this can be difficult for us as Americans because we may not be comfortable. We might say, well, we're secular. We think it's better for religion to be more private. So one thing that I always try to emphasize when I talk about this is it's good to separate our own personal preferences and personal biases from what we think is appropriate for a different region in the world. And it's ultimately up to the people who live in these countries to decide how they want to live, right? So if they want to have a larger role for Islam in public life, within reason, we're not talking about, we're not talking about, I think when people hear larger role for Islam in public life, they automatically think Iran or some brutal theocracy. That's not correct. There are different interpretations of Islamic law. Some are more conservative, some are more progressive, some are more accommodating of pluralism and freedom. Others are more restrictive. So there's a wide, there's a wide array of options there. But generally, most of the polling that we have suggests that significant majorities in in most Arab, in most Middle Eastern countries, as well in, as well as in South and Southeast Asia, want to see a significant role for Islam. So, if they express that through the democratic process peacefully, and they vote for parties that represent those views, I think that we as Americans have to have at least some deference for those preferences. Instead of saying you have to be more like us, we're liberal, we're secular you got to transform into us. So that's, that's, that, so that's, that's how I think about a potential resolution to this struggle, right? It's not going to be easy. And, um, one thing and, um, it's dark, but the, the, the first, um, the, the title of the first chapter of the book, um, is to take joy in a massacre. And I, I talk about the, these very vivid images that I saw, and that I, that I, in some sense, was a part of in the lead up to what was the worst massacre 
in modern Egyptian history, which happened on August 14th, 2013. And I try to use this massacre to understand how Egyptians could turn against each other because Egypt doesn't really have a history of civil war or of violent conflict between citizens. Usually it's the state repressing its citizens, but here we have people turning against each other. Um, and that was very frightening. And there's a personal element here because I was in Egypt in the week leading up to the massacre. I left Egypt on August 12th, 2013. The killings happened on August 14th. So, um, and that's crazy to think that I was actually living in a country that was building up to this very dark moment. And the person, the more personal element is, as I mentioned, because I'm originally Egyptian, that um, most of my family supported the mass killings against the Muslim Brotherhood. They hate the Muslim Brotherhood um, and they supported the military when it was cracking down and when it went into this square in broad daylight and just used live ammunition and killed um, about a thousand people in just the span of hours. So then I tried to make sense of this. How is it possible that people who are dear to me that I love that I've known for such a long time, and I think they're otherwise good people, right? But these otherwise good people came to support, in my view, an evil thing. And, and this is always what, a, what was this exactly? Uh... Yeah. So after the military coup, which happened in July 2013, so as I mentioned, the Muslim Brotherhood came to power. President Mohammed Morsi, who just passed away recently um, in prison. Um, in, a, in, in court while he was being tried. Um, Mohammed Morsi became president. He's a senior figure. He was a senior figure in the Muslim Brotherhood. And this was in Egypt, uh, right? Egypt, yeah. So you had democratic elections. The Muslim Brotherhood does well. It wins. It comes to power. It wins not just one election, but actually several elections. And then um, there, but there are a number, there's a large number of Egyptians who don't like the Brotherhood from 2012 to 2013, we see growing polarization where Egyptians come to see each other as enemies, in part because they disagree over these fundamental existential issues having to do with religion. They see the Brotherhood as a party that will change the nature of the state and, and make Egypt into some kind of religious regime. So you have secular and even non and even just ordinary Egyptians of different stripes seeing the Brotherhood as a threat. So you have people can debate debate how divided the country was. It might have been 50, 50, 60, 40, something like that. But my family tends uh, most of my family in Egypt tends to represent what might be called the secular elite They're um, And they're very suspicious of these religious parties. And that's one reason that they felt that these mass killings were justified because they said, um, I thought this was very unfortunate that they said this, but we got in these debates when I was in Egypt that year that um, the brotherhood, um, that um, uh, they, they, um, they were afraid that if the brotherhood stayed in power, that it would, it, it would keep on winning elections. It would, it would gain more power and that it would transform the country. And they said, well, democracy is nice in theory, but we're the ones who have to live with the consequences of elections. So you Americans, and they see me primarily as an American who has no right to speak about Egypt. So this led to a lot of tension in the broader family because they would say, well, you're born and raised in America. You're an American citizen. Why are you coming and telling us that we have to respect democratic elections when you're not the one who has to live with the consequences of those elections. And actually, I think that um, you hear this in a lot of places beyond the Middle East, where um, people, if they see a party that wins, that they don't like. Also, there's a fire truck in the background. <laughs> That's okay. I think we've had a few on our end, too. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, but, um, you know, we have this, too, where like if Donald Trump wins, people say, well, oh, he's not legitimate or we want to get rid of him by any means because 
yeah, he may have gotten elected through democratic means, but he's so bad and he's such a threat to America and our values as Americans that we don't care about the democratic process anymore. And that's why my experiences in the Middle East inform how I view American politics and the way we talk about the rise of right-wing populists in 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 Europe or in the rise of uh, Hindu nationalism in India or Duterte in the Philippines. This is happening throughout the world where the real test of your commitment to democracy is whether you're willing to respect democratic outcomes even when people you hate or fear come to power through democratic means. I'm a big believer that even if you hate someone or you hate a party that wins freely and fairly, you can, you can fight that through the ballot box and you can try to persuade your fellow citizens to have a different view but you can't undo the results of the ballot box because once you do that, there's no way to resolve differences peacefully because one of the great things about democracy, I would argue, is that it's the, it may not be perfect, but it's the only way to resolve differences peacefully. Otherwise, you resort, you resort to coercion, force, violence, and repression. There's no other way. Hey everyone, thanks so much for watching the episode. If you're interested in contributing to the conversation and supporting the show, there's two easy things you can do. One, click subscribe. And two, visit our Patreon page where you get exclusive access to the Exploring Minds community.